next uh, speaker is me. Um, <laughs> Who's going to give you the talk? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to throw something if I, if I don't know. Um, first, I want to introduce you to the team from Western Sydney Uni. Um, so myself, uh, Niraj Yadav, who's a PhD student who started with us in April. Han Xia Yu, who's a PhD student who's visiting us, um, who's been visiting us this year. Um, and Jason Reynolds, um, who's a geochemist. Um, I'm a soil biologist. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a bit today about some of the, the research that we've been doing, including some of our findings. Um, but first I'll just introduce uh, I'll just introduce the talk by, um, um, so a lot of the soils that we think about when we're thinking about using fertilizers um, for food production, they're, they're soils like this. Um, so they're really productive, they've got a um, really thick organic layer, um, and then they're, they're really well drained in the, um, in the profile below. Um, so these are, these are fertile soils and they're very responsive to fertilizers that, that are added. Um, there are issues associated with them, though. If they're well-drained, you can um, end up with leaching, um, uh, modification, denitrification. These are things that have been discussed already today, um, and there are some research needs around that. Um, but there's also other types of soils. So um, this is a soil from uh, nearby in Western Sydney, um, uh, uh, near Penrith. Um, this is a, it's a really difficult soil to work with. Um, it's at the Nepean Lakes area, um, and, and um, they've really struggled to, to plant trees into the soil. Um, they've got a really low success rate associated with it. Um, and so one of those issues um, is, a, is associated with this really, um, it's really clay. Um, it's really difficult for those plants to grow. Um, they get waterlogged quite easily, um, and so forth. And so I think there's a there's an opportunity here associated with some of these um, products that, that the hub is producing um, where we can potentially um, use some of these products in order to release some of these uh, soils um, to, from these constraints, allow them to recover. Um, so just it's not just about food production, it's about um, turning some of our green spaces into environments that are um, perhaps more desirable um, for, for growing trees, growing some horticultural um, plants as well. Um, here's another example. So this is a soil at Sydney Science Park. Um, it's just, it's horrible. It's just, it's um, and compacted. Um, it's really difficult to get stuff to grow in it. Um, and they're very interested in uh, alleviating constraints associated with um, nutrients and, and just um, um, other other constraints. Um, so just some of the things that we've been doing, I'm going to race through these things pretty quickly. Um, this is largely work that Niraj and Haikshia have been doing. Um, we've done a little bit of a analysis. So we're, we're working with, with your ball. Um, I don't know what batch we're working with. Um, and so we've done a little bit of analysis of it, and, and we're particularly keen in how the characteristics of the fertilizer influence the interactions between the soil that the fertilizer is added to and the nutrients that are within that, that fertilizer. So I'll show you a result of one of the experiments that, that Niraj did. Um, and then we're also doing some measuring um, plant and soil responses and some pot experiments at, at this point um, in response to the fertilizer. Um, so um, here's uh, one of the bottles that, that we're working with. Um, when we analyzed the fertilizer, we found that by, by the time that it got to us, um, there, there were some differences associated with some of the elements. Largely, it was most of the things were higher than, than what it said on the bottle. Um, sulfur was a bit lower. Um, a, a few things. Um, so the concentration of total dissolved salts was, was actually quite a bit higher in it, um, and the pH was was very very low, um, and so this is something that um, the um, it's by this again this is by the time it got to us. So this is a, um, a constraint associated with the product that probably needs to be dealt with. Um, one thing that we measured in it was was silicon. 
So um, we were a little surprised that there was so much silicon in it, but I guess we shouldn't be that surprised because silicon's a, an element that's um, um, present in a lot of plants and, and most of it gets, gets excreted. Um, we don't really absorb um, very much of it at all. And this is a potential opportunity. So there's a lot of interest in silicon-based fertilizers here in Australia. Um, so that's something that we could perhaps talk about. Um, I've got a slide here that um, basically the take home from this, you already know, is that we have to balance. Uh, when we're using uh, this in a, whatever context we're using it in, where we're trying to improve the fertility of soils and improve plant growth, we have to consider both the availability of the nutrients to plants, but also we have to balance the losses associated with greenhouse gases um, and, and leaching. Um, and particularly for liquid fertilizers, um, one thing that we do wanna do is we wanna make sure that those, those nutrients are staying within the soil. They might not all immediately be taken up by the plants. And in cases like that, we wanna encourage a healthy soil in order for those nutrients to be immobilized for brief periods of time within the, the soil biology and then to release those nutrients um, slowly through time. Um, and that, that's something that varies a lot from, from soil to soil. Um, here's an experiment where we're just looking at the behavior of the, when we incubate different types of soil with the fertilizer and we get very, very different results. Um, so the, the dashed line shows you basically how much phosphorus is present um, within the soil solution without adding any, any fertilizer to it, without adding any nutrient to it. And what we find for these three, four, uh, these four soils that we used, collected from a, a few different places around Western Sydney, um, when we just add orthophosphate, which is the green one, it basically, that that fertilizer gets bound to, physically bound and chemically bound to the, the, the soil um, for that day or so that, the, that it, that it um, spends incubating with the soil. Um, but the yerval, the phosphorus in the yerval, um, depending on what soil you do, changes a lot, the amount of phosphorus within solution. So for for our two soils in Richmond, um, which are these very sandy soils, they've got very low levels of organic matter. Um, that phosphorus availability shoots shoots way up. Okay, um, there's very little um, phosphate buffering capacity within these soils. Um, yeah, and so the the availability of it is is very high. Potentially, there's an issue there with leaching, and so we want to make sure that there's a lot of roots and a lot of um, other microorganisms in there that can take it up. With our soil from Picton, so this is a pasture system, um, has low phosphorus availability, um, but it's got a really high amount of organic matter. And that um, phosphorus that's in the herbal um, is binding very quickly. It's got a very, very low phos uh, phosphorus availability. Um, and so, yeah, so just, just the, the main take home message is that um, how, we need to think about how these fertile. We need to understand how these fertilizers are interacting with these different soil types to understand how plants are going to respond. Um, I'll just kind of very briefly go over um, an, uh, the pot experiment the, um, that Hangsha and Niraj are currently doing. Um, so this uh, just some photos of it. We've got some um, gas chambers that we're using to sample greenhouse gases from these pots. Um, there's Hanksia um, adding some um, fertilizer solution to the pots. Um, just a few images associated with it um, at a very, very high level. Um, so we used a mineral fertilizer that we dissolved before adding it, and then we've got Yerval, and we added it at two rates, okay? So, and then we grew two different plants associated with these. So these are both pasture species. Um, and we had used rates that are uh, associated with um, pasture fertilizer application rates, including one that's very high. We kind of wanted to push the system. It's within the range of what farmers might use, but it's a very high rate. Um, what we found at this, at this lower rate was that the plants generally responded very well to it. 
Um, you can't really see it in this image with the lights on in the room, but these um, grasses are very, very green. They've absorbed a lot of nitrogen to the point that um, we actually ended up with an aphid problem. The aphids just love them. <laughs> um, however, when we got to the high rate, the plants um, with the mineral fertilizer were doing just fine, uh, not so much. We don't know if this was a pH issue. We don't know if it was a salinity issue. We don't know if it was a nitrogen toxicity issue. This is something that we need to, we need to learn. Um, anyway, I'll, um, I've used up my time. Um, I'll just leave it there. The, again, the main takeaway here is that um, there's a lot that we don't know about how these fertilizers interact with soil. Um, there's a lot that we can learn, um, including ways in which we might modify the product. Um, we, hopefully we can interact to, to find out how we can do that. Additional amendments. Are there things that we can add? We, we could add gypsum to raise the pH, but then we're just digging stuff out of the ground. That's not really, um, that's not really what we're aiming for here. So are there other products that we could um, recycle, recover, and apply that could um, help these things work well? Anyway, I'll leave it there, um, and we'll move on to our next talk.